So, thank you. Hello. I'm um, just going to um, make the introduction while Reza is setting up the slides. Um, I would like to uh, obviously talk a bit more about how I've come to campaign against gender segregation, but in the interest of time, I'll cut that short and start right away with the um, guidance on gender segregation that Universities UK, which is the representative bodies of all public universities in the UK, has issued. And um, this, these guidelines um, said, and that has often been misreported in the press, these guidelines uh, talked about how an external speaker coming to a university um, should be allowed to impose, and specifically using that word, gender segregation on the audience that they are speaking to as their right to free expression. So probably that won't make a lot of sense to me. It didn't make a lot of sense to me. So what I did, so, um, once we had these, uh, once this, this guidelines came out, I contacted Mariam and um, a couple of other activists, and together we started this great campaign. Can you go on? One more. One more. One more. Yes, please. Exactly. So we had, um, just to recap quickly, we had a 10,000 strong petition um, against the uh, gender segregation guidelines of the UK, University of the UK. Um, we had a rally at the offices with great speakers like uh, Pragna, uh, like um, Gita, like uh, Kate Smith-Waite, who's also here today, Mariam, obviously. We had also um, um, Yasmin Adabai-Brown. Yasmin was also supporting Peter, sent her an address. Uh, we wrote a letter to Farida Shahid, the UN Special Rapporteur on Cultural Rights. Um, right about a Cambridge student had a legal notice sent to University of UK saying that if they did rescind their guidelines and amend them in a way um, that um, well, would outlaw gender segregation, um, uh, that they would face legal action. We got great support from various, um, from all across the part of the political spectrum, from Labour, the SNP, uh, from Tories, and including the Prime Minister. So, I mean, I'm personally, I'm not the biggest fan of David Cameron. Um, I must say, in, that, in, in this very instance, he got it right. He probably didn't really get it right for the right reasons. But anyway, I think most uh, campaigners would be happy if they had the, the um, you know, um, support from the, the, the Prime Minister. So, University UK withdrew the guidance. Um, and the uh, Equality and Human Rights Commission announced that they were going to issue a new guidance. Um, so the new guidance said that gender segregation is not permitted, very clearly we're subject to certain um, very specific exceptions, and that universities have a duty to publish and keep up to date a code on, of practice which addresses the conduct of events in its premises. And they are legally obliged to take any available and alternative reasonable practical steps to avoid uh, or prevent gender segregation from happening, and if ever it has happened, they are legally urged to ensure that it did not recur, recur in the future. So um, what I did, obviously, I'm, I'm a bit, how do you say, mistrusting from university through my own personal experience from uh, universities. Um, those who know what I've been doing would probably know why I say that. Um, and I sent a freedom of information request to all universities um, in the UK. Uh, that are member of universities, okay, that's all public universities. And this requested information on how um, universities are assessing whether certain events or meetings are at risk of transegregation. Obviously, there needs to be some kind of assessment um, or some kind of understanding whether there might or might, may not be transegregation at an event, how they are monitoring whether certain kinds of events are actually um, at, um, being transegregated and how they are, wow, that is. That is far too little time. So anyway, um, so and how they prevent gentrification from happening. So um, this is a sample, 134 universities, 113 replied, 19 did not reply. I sent a lot of follow-up emails, and what I'm going to present now is new evidence and data that I have not presented yet um, on how uh, the universities responded. So I developed a coding scheme according to whether universities had no provision at all, had general provisions not specific to gender segregation, had um, general but not very specific um, provisions on gender segregation, had specific provisions on gender segregation, or had specific provisions that were um, implicit, explicitly part of the rules of the code of practice of the university. So, safeguards against gender segregation in general. We have 34 universities who have none whatsoever four to who have general ones, not specific to gender segregation, and uh, five who reach the best category of four, so to speak. So um, a total gives that from zero, 
well, those who coded zero to one um, have insufficient safeguards that are 65% of universities in the UK. And this 11% here, the F, is um, the universities that are still developing these safeguards. Risk assessment is something that is being done um, properly by about, not properly, more or less properly by 20% of universities in the UK. 8% are still developing it. And 72% have non, no risk assessment whatsoever or just general ones. Um, same picture for monitoring events that are risk agenda segregation. 73% of universities do not do that at all or do not do that in specific to gender segregation. 17% have some kind of provisions, 10% are still developing. And the worst, um, the worst um, numbers are for the prevention of gender segregation, that 80% do have no measures to in place whatsoever to prevent gender segregation from happening. 10% do, 10% are still developing. Um, so um, if we you know, use this coding scheme that I used, four is the best possible value that's here. As you can see, in general kind of provisions, we have quite a big gap here. Um, so this would be three, would be, in my opinion, an acceptable level. Two would be the absolute necessary minimum to ensure that uh, universities are preventing investigation from happening and our safeguarding students, and this is where we are right now. So it's an extremely poor performance, um, despite the huge public attention that our campaign created. Um, so I, I won't probably go into too much detail here, but um, these are the universities where we have confirmed and verified cases of investigation, and as you can see here, they are farly, they are, um, they're hardly faring better on average. They're faring a bit better but still, even those who have proven cases, like for example, the University of Glasgow, they have no safeguards, no provisions whatsoever. And so uh, in terms of the second part of the uh, um, genocidation, um, uh, the, the uh, Freedom of Information request are sent, asked also for other events, and I found, again, that there were other non-publicized events at the London School of Economics, the Institute of Education, Bradford, Liverpool, Leicester, and those were done by our personal friends from the Islamic Education and Research Academy called IERA, probably most of you are familiar with them. Um, unsurprisingly, Islamic Students and Theology Societies, but also from or by Orthodox Jewish societies or you know, events or celebrations, and also Christian student societies. So um, it's not quite accurate to say this is only a problem that is related to Islamic um, student societies. Or So um, just to wrap up very quickly, and I'm very uh, aware of time, uh, I think when we, ha when we know, for example, that the Federation of Islamic Student Societies has still in their guidelines explicitly, and it's still there, you can go on the website and read it for yourself, it still will say, maintain segregation between brothers and sisters, keep interaction between them at a minimum. Um, on the other hand, some of the responses that I received were actually quite shocking in the sense that the University of Arts of London actually said that, well, I think, you know, students' unions that is the student union of that university, would take a sensitive, flexible, and collaborative approach to student members that may prefer gender-segregated seating arrangements. So, I mean, you can, uh, I personally interpret, uh, interpret in a way of saying like, well, no, I, actually, gender segregation is still going on, it's still okay. And um, the University of London actually says, um, well, if a private booking event for an event would involve segregation on gender grounds, the conference office would request that the Harris make it clear to their guests in advance that such segregation would be taking place. Well, if that is not endorsement of gender segregation, I don't know what it is. So um, if you just, in terms of conclusions, um, we have a highly publicized campaign. We had strong opposition to our campaign from Islamist groups, but also from student representatives. Um, Six months after the um, issuing of the HRC guidance, universities still have insufficient safeguards against gender segregation. Most do not risk assess, monitor, or prevent gender segregation. And even universities with verified instances of gender segregation fare hardly better than those that do not. And some universities still appear to be allowing gender segregation. And I would love to discuss these details in more detail with all of you in the Q&A session. Thank you.